PhD student in the Emerging Infectious Diseases graduate program here at the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. Welcome to our Founders Day celebration. Please stand by for the national anthem sung by Air Force Second Lieutenant Christine Kwok, F. Edward Ebert School of Medicine, Class of 2023. Oh, say, can you see but early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the rain Thank you, Lieutenant Kwok. Esteemed guests, we are pleased to welcome you to today's ceremony, signifying the 48th year of the university's founding in 1972. Today, we recognize our students and faculty who come from all over our great nation to become part of this unique and exciting educational experience, and our alumni whose incredible contributions to medicine, nursing, dentistry, allied health, public health and health education and policy continue to serve as an inspiration for future generations. I would like to introduce our speakers for today's ceremony. Dr. Richard Thomas, President, Uniformed Services University and Ambassador Deborah L. Burks, MD, Office of the White House, Coronavirus Response Coordinator and Associate Advisor, Office of the Vice President of the United States. Everyone, it is my pleasure to welcome President Thomas. Dr. Thomas? Well, thank you, Ms. Adikar. Do you have good uh, sound for me? Yes, we're good. Okay, you got it. First off, I wanna thank you all for all those folks that had uh, took a, a significant part here to put this together today. Um, a lot of work behind the scenes. So thank you very much for everything you've done, Ms. Holland, Dr. Longacre, of course, Rama, uh, all your all the folks involved in this, and folks whose names you you don't see appear, but uh, also um, uh, for Lieutenant Kwok, that was that was a, a great rendition of the national anthem. Thanks for that too. Very difficult to do under these these uh, conditions, but I think we're all getting better at using this technology. So as you heard a moment ago, it's been uh, 48 years since we founded this university. President Nixon signed the Public Law 92-426, which established the Uniform Services University, as well as the Health Profession Scholarship Program. Now, since that time, and over the years, we've proven this university's value over and over again through education of generations of healthcare professionals contributing to the preparation of a ready medical force. Our alumni have supported combat operations, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief missions, literally across the globe. And whether it's our research efforts in support of HIV and AIDS, Ebola, SARS, MERS, and now of course the COVID-19 pandemic, all this has led to advances in patient care, which have benefited not only our nation, but many other across our global community. 
Our faculty experts have been called upon time and again by the military health system, the Department of Defense, and national leadership in areas such as traumatic brain injury, suicide, post-traumatic stress, deployment stress, trauma, critical care, infectious diseases, many other areas. This university has proven vital to our military's readiness, but also to the health of our nation. Since the start of this global, global pandemic, USU faculty, researchers, and students have played a critical role in the COVID-19 response, from genomic sequencing of the virus, to vaccine development, to the treatment of critically ill patients, to the design, evaluation, and testing of potentially life-saving technologies, and more. We have led every step of the way just as it has been since the beginning of our time here. As you heard earlier today in our other Founders Day events, our alumni have demonstrated through their incredible achievements and contributions that we're all doing, the work that we're doing here at the university is vitally important work. Our alumni are leaders in healthcare, whether it's in the hospital, the research labs, or in some austere environment around the world. I couldn't be more proud of them and of all of you for what you've done or what you will do and the significant contributions you'll make to our mission and to our national defense. So congratulations to all of you on our first 48. Now today, we're extremely fortunate to have our guest speaker, Ambassador Deborah L. Burks. And I wanna read a little bit about her bio. I encourage you all to do the same and I'm just gonna you know, hit the high points here, but it's an extensive and, and fabulously interesting a career that Dr. Burks has had. She is our nation's coronavirus response coordinator in the Office of the Vice President of the United States. And prior to this appointment, Dr. Burks served as the coordinator for the United States government activities to combat HIV AIDS and the US Special Representative to the Global Health Diplomacy. Ambassador Burks is a world-renowned medical expert and a leader in the field of HIV AIDS. Her three decade long career is focused on HIV AIDS immunology, vaccine research, and global health. She also serves as the U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator and oversees the implementation of the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, the largest, which represents the largest commitment by any nation to combat a single disease in the history of the world. In her role as the U.S. Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy, she's worked to align the U.S. government's diplomacy with foreign assistance programs that address global health challenges and accelerate prog progress towards achieving an age-free generation, ending preventable child and maternal deaths, and preventing, detecting, and responding to infectious disease threats wherever they arise. Dr. Burks has a military career history, and she served more than 29 years on active duty in the United States Army, beginning her career in the Army in 1985 as a military trained clinician in immunology, focusing on HIV and AIDS vaccine research. She rose to the ranks she became the director of the U.S. Military HIV Research Program at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And she did that, I think, from 1996 to about 2005. But during that time, she led one of the most influential HIV vaccine trials in history, uh, and that which really has provided the first supporting evidence of any vaccine, the potential effectiveness in preventing HIV infection. Uh, Dr. Burks retired at the rank of Colonel in the United States Army and was awarded many uh, prestigious awards and, and recognitions for her service, her leadership, and her management skills during her tenure in the Department of Defense. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really my distinct pleasure to welcome Ambassador Burks. Wonderful to be with all of you today. I'm going to do a brief um, PowerPoint presentation just to give you an idea of how important I think schools like the uniform services are, how they can answer unique research questions. So I just want to go through some slides to really talk about the importance of science, both the clinical basic and translational research. And I think the really critical role that the uniform services can can provide bringing together their research skills, their clinical skills, and their work with the community, which is the military base. Really, this all starts with the importance of data and data triangulation. So I'm gonna go through a set of slides, but I wanna really concentrate on the ending slide, and we're gonna cover that twice then. So I'm just bear with me for a second and let me take you through to the end. Great. So just to go through some um, quick elements, 
these are the questions that I think universities and critical DOD institutes and scientists can ask for ask and answer for us. Under the COVID HIV vaccine development, we really have questions about the durability of the spike protein antibody. And we have questions about its age, race, ethnicity, and gender in relationship to that durability. Certainly the military and the access to the research components it has could answer and ask of this question. We also have questions about natural COVID immune responses by age, differences in T cell and B cell immunity by age, race, ethnicity, and gender. Then I think there's some really key questions related to the level of COVID antibody prevalence in resource limited settings, and particularly in our allied forces. We've known from all around looking at COVID around the world that it's very different in place to place. From the therapeutic vet development, we know that the military can really look at combination therapies among its active forces. And then I really, this is very important to me, is using viral sequencing to determine the relative risk of each environment and an impact on viral spread. And because the military has unique situations and unique combined living quarters and unique ability to having to train together and its concept of pods and teams, by using viral sequencing, we can actually trace viruses to sources and really understand how spread did occur. And we have a real question about duration of quarantine. None of these studies have been done among asymptomatics or mild disease. And we really want to understand after that exposure, how long do people actually need to quarantine? Is it the full 14 days? This kind of window testing of daily testing and personnel to determine the quarantine min window will be really quite critical to us. Now I'm going to switch the beginning of the slides because I don't know why it started at the end. Um, so bear with me for just a second till I get to the top of the presentation, which will be really, I think hopefully we'll ask and answer some questions. And so really talking about the importance of science, clinical, basic and translational research. All of it begins with data and being able to triangulate data to generate a common understanding, a shared idea of what the requirements are and really identifying all the knowledge gaps. When we look at COVID cases around the world, this was the first thing that generated a lot of questions, I think, around the world, and that a lot of the cases were not found in resource-limited settings. And indeed, the majority of the mortality have not been in Africa, but have been solely or primarily in Asia, Europe, and North America, and now South America. Okay, you'll see many of the cases are in upper income and home middle income um, countries. And then if you look at mortality, it's all really in high income and upper middle income countries. This really starts to open up questions about respiratory diseases beyond um, particularly avian flu or the questions we had about flu in general. And now with COVID really looks like primarily those that were at risk were from upper middle income and, and middle income, um, upper income countries. Now in the United States, we know that we had the original outbreak in the April, May, uh, the March, Mar April timeframe, which then became the surge that we saw in the summer across the Southern states. Um, but interesting to look at this mortality plot and it shows that we have had much fewer mortality from this last outbreak across the South, even though we've had more cases, really showing that we've had improvement in the treatment and a different age spectrum in this recent outbreak across the South. Just want to take you quickly to get you a big perspective over the last seven months of what we see with this virus. And this is looking at RNA PCR lab test positivity. And I know it's hard for you to even see where the virus was on March 15th, but it was in Long Island, which you can see lit up, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, Miami, and of course in Washington state. A month later with better testing and broader testing, you can see now we're actually able to see the concentration of the virus between Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, on um, the whole metro area. New Orleans. And then our 
um, Native Americans out. And then the 15th of May, when things started to improve, and the 15th of May was really about um, outbreaks that were being contained with improvements then across the Northeast. By the 15th of June, we continue to see improvement across the Northeast, but then we started to see the impact of Memorial Day across the South and up the West Coast, which then became the 15th July significant outbreak across Texas, Arizona, into Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, and Florida. And what you will notice is it was a very different outbreak in that both rural and urban areas were equally um, impacted by this outbreak. And then here we are in September showing significant improvement across the South, um, still stability in the Northeast, but movement of the virus into the heartland and up up through the Great Plains into South Dakota and North Dakota. And we think this was largely related to vacation and vacation um, transmission across the United States into these areas. We track everything across every state. We're looking at test positivity and improvement in test positivity. And then we ha have created grading criteria across every state so that we can look at where they are with cases, test positivity, um, and um, hospital utilization. So to just give you a quick run through of the daily data that we look at and why we think this is important, this looks at emergency room visits this in the red line, cases in the black bars, It look at the number of daily tests performed and the test positivity, and this is Alabama. And I really wanted to highlight this for you. Into data, you can see through March and April there was very little increase after Memorial Day, and the fact that it was distributed through multiple counties in Alabama, in Florida, very similar, um, very small amount of cases in the spring. Um, very low test positivity until Memorial Day, and then you see that peak both in cases, test positivity, which remarkably improved. But you can see there was obviously very much in Miami and Broward County and Palm Beach with significant improvement. And this is cases over time, and you can see there's a real flattening of all of the cases over time. This is Louisiana, and I really wanted to show this one to you because you can see that the outbreak in the March-April timeframe was really in New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Most of the other counties were very little virus, but in this summer outbreak, and this really illustrates the, pro the issue, this was widespread we think due to asymptomatic spread of under 30 year olds um, during vacation back to local parishes. And then you can see spread throughout the state illustrated in these rising lines. Um, this is Mississippi again showing that improvement, decreasing number of cases and case presentations at emergency rooms in the red line, decreased test positivity. And again, like Alabama and um, Florida and now Louisiana, it was across both the, earl, the urban and rural counties. And the reason I wanted to emphasize that because we get this was a virus in the metro areas, but I really want to remember that this is a virus that, that can become very widespread in both urban and rural areas. Then to show you um, improvements in mortality over time, and really shows that in April there was a peak mortality of about 30%, um, 30 per 100 cases. That has dropped dramatically over time with improvements in treatment and care. Really, this shows you how science and data needs to be transmitted quickly and quickly around the country to improve care in the hospitals and in outpatients. But also importantly, with, with the availability of remdesivir in June, you can see the significant decline in mortality and the use of convalescent plasma, as well as the use of late stage steroids. And you can see that improvement in the over 70s in the individuals 40 to 69, the 18 to 39, and the under 18, where the mortality is extraordinarily low and those lines are overlapping. So really under 40 looks the same 
um, no matter um, what age band that you're in. And over time, we've seen Im improvement in the daily hospitalizations. So ending where I started, there's really the importance all, all of the time for everyone to stay up with the data, not only because we need to all to work together with using masks and physically distancing and avoiding crowds and really protecting those in our families that are vulnerable, but really the research institution and the science and the driving of um, the Uniform Services School really brings together scientists that can do translational research and answer these really critical questions that we have, um, including the impact of telehealth counseling. And I think we've moved a lot to telehealth and I think it's really important to really look at what the effectiveness is of telehealth counseling and I think it's been very, but I think there, there are really questions that working together through the military members and a basic science to the bedside and to the, and to the um, community to really answer these critical questions. So I'll stop there to see if you have other questions for me. Thank you, Dr. Burks. We have received several questions from members of our USU community that we'd like to share with you. First, how do you think that we can increase scientific literacy and public trust in science? Well, I think what's really important is communicating and overly communicating and overly communicating. And as is really get, getting individuals to understand that we ask and answer questions and those answers sometimes change how we were thinking before. Um, so it, science evolves and I think sometimes we want it to be static and we want it to be unchanging and I think it's difficult for the public when we continue to evolve our understanding but to me that is a good thing that means there are people out there always striving to make things better whether it's clinical care in COVID-19 or vaccine development are these really critical understandings of how this what kind of situations is this virus more transmittable? We know from contact tracing what we think, but we could really do that molecular tracing, which I think will be critically important for this understanding in the future. Thank you. Could you please describe what is being done to strengthen our disease surveillance and preparedness for a future outbreak? I think a question arrived March, early March, talked about what's happening at the laboratory, what is the nucleic acid test positivity, what's happening at the hospitals and the clinic. We don't have a natural integration between our lab clinical laboratory systems, our clinical systems, and our public health systems. And I think in many countries, those are one and the same. There's just one health system, but we have different health systems. So bringing that data together was very difficult. At one time, we were pulling from 250 different streams of data. We've been working with states and their public health institutions and, I, and with the hospital associations. And I think we're finally bringing all of those pieces together. But I think to be prepared for the next pandemic, we need to really work together across the country to bring all of that data and visibility together because everybody needs what I just went through. They need that at the health commissioner and the county level to really understand how the virus is moving in that county. Who's, where's the outbreak occurring and how are we going to stop it? All of this data has to not only be collected, but visualized and acted on. And I think we really as a country need to work on that piece. Thank you. Given that multiple academic and pharmaceutical entities working on vaccines are currently targeting different aspects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to generate an immune response, is there a possibility people receiving multiple COVID-19 vaccines may have the best chance of immune coverage? But all of the vaccines are identical in targeting the spike protein. And so what we have in under development right now and what is in the advanced clinical trials of phase three and rapidly finishing their enrollment. The Pfizer and Moderna product are both messenger RNAs that are expressing the spike protein, so you develop the antibody to the spike protein. The two vector vaccines are also expressing the spike protein. And then we have two baclovirus expressed um, subunit proteins that are going into evaluation. 
So it's the different platforms all focused on generating the same spike protein antibody and of course the cellular immunity that will go with that. And so that's why when they talk about the vaccines, they talk about safety and efficacy because it's a, all of these vaccine products are very much focused on the same epitope, the epitope that we know is associated with neutralizing antibody and the epitope that then blocks um, the virus moving into the ACE2 receptor. And so this is where all of the vaccine work is focused at this time. That's where the monoclonal antibody therapeutic work is focused. And so, and that was with the convalescent plasma, the relationship between the titer to the spike protein and the ability to change the outcome of the inpatient. So they're all really focused on the most on the identical epitope, just different ways of expressing the protein to generate an immune response. Thank you. And lastly, how have your military and military research backgrounds influenced your approach to your roles as PEPFAR ambassador and on the VP's COVID-19 task force? Well, thank you. And I tell you at the time when I was active duty, um, I was 29 years active duty, um, active duty army, regular army. And I think what was amazing at the time is the level of investment in training in management and leadership skills, which I can tell you at the time as a young physician, I really couldn't understand the importance of all of that leadership and management and budget training or in the logistical training and the acquisition training that I received when I went to the rare. But now I can tell you every day, I use that training, every bit of it. I used all of it within PEPFAR. And I think what the State Department has helped with is additional diplomacy skills and working internationally. But I will tell you the military training and the investment they make in each and every person to really develop these additional skill sets were really critical. In addition, I think the agreement that RARE had with, and continues to have with NIH, my um, immunology fellowship was a joint fellowship between NIAID and Walter Reed. And that allowed us really the opportunity to do both clinical care and clinical research and basic research. And I think that that ability to work from bench to bedside continuously is the what really is it trying better instantly is improved and the quicker that you can move to the bedside becomes really impatience um, and I remain impatient in getting things done that really impact the lives of others and so I think you know right now yes I would really like to have a COVID-19 vaccine because we know how important that is in stopping infectious disease pandemics. But of course, we want a safe and effective vaccine. But I would like to have had one you can come that earlier you have masking and physics, we could save. It is also treated, taught me impatience. So um, I think that is a good part of the military training to always strive to do better and to really be part of a team. Thank you. Really appreciate sharing with you all today. Well, everyone, I want to, once again, on behalf of the entire Uniformed Services University community, I want to uh, thank Dr. Burks for speaking today. Uh, Ma'am, it was an honor. And I would also like to thank the many distinguished guests and all of you have really taken the time today to participate and carved out this schedule within your busy uh, work and uh, schedules to be here and to join us and celebrate this year's Founders Day, uh, our 48th. And uh, so I wanna thank everyone for everything you've done to make this a successful time. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you again in the near future. Thank you. Esteemed guests, thank you for joining us for our 48th anniversary Founders Day celebration. I would also like to once again thank Second Lieutenant Kwok for the national anthem, as well as all of the behind the scenes organizers of today's events, especially Mr. Jeffrey John. This concludes today's ceremony. Have a safe and enjoyable weekend. <laughs>